We all have a past, don't we? I know I do. And I would probably say you do. You know, here's what I believe. Most of us struggle with the negative things in our past. You know, maybe those heated words, maybe adultery, addiction, broken relationships, maybe that divorce, maybe we stole something or cheated or we lied, or maybe the loss of a loved one, maybe of a job, maybe financial troubles, maybe a childhood that was troubled. But here's what I know about me and I know it about you. We've all gotten it wrong. We've all sinned. We all have a past that involves negative things, regrets, if you will. And if we're not careful, what happens is it keeps us stuck. And what happens is we dwell and we live in the past and it brings depression, ulcers, discouragement, a sense of hopelessness, a lack of trust, a fear, unhappiness, and feelings of inadequacy, and the questions of God's ability to forgive and accept or maybe even provide or give us a pathway is questioned. But I want you to know today that with God's help, you can overcome your past and you can experience joy. You can experience contentment. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, he writes to the church in Corinth, and they experienced all those things that I just mentioned. And here's what he writes to them. He says, you have been bought and paid for by Christ, so you belong to him. Be free, be free now from all of these earthly prides and fears. And that is so true. You see, in this life, we've all made mistakes. We've all done things that we regret and you can't escape it, and I can't escape it. But if we're not careful, regret can turn into guilt. Guilt can lead to condemnation, and it can become a cycle that is very, very hard to break and be free from. And so what I wanna do is I wanna help you to understand that there's a difference between regret and conviction, between guilt and conviction. You see, regret is a tool that the enemy wants to use to keep you and I trapped in a life of condemnation. And yet Jesus lets us know that the Holy Spirit has come to convict you and I of sin so that what happens is we can experience healing. And it's this conviction that the Holy Spirit brings that leads you and I to repent, which causes you and I to grow and to become unstuck and to be able to move forward because focusing on regret and living in guilt only leads to you and I remaining in the past. And so what I wanna do is I wanna show you the difference between the two. And so let's, let's look at it. Guilt destroys your confidence, right? See, here's what I believe. You can't be confident if you have guilt in your life. It makes us insecure. You're always worried. What if somebody finds out? What if somebody really learns the truth about me? They may reject me. They'll find out that I'm not cracked up to be who I have portrayed myself to be. And so as a result, we're afraid of other people and it destroys our confidence. And yet what we see here is that guilt destroys our confidence, but conviction destroys your pride. You see this pride that keeps you and I to want to live in the past and protect ourselves. It's done away with when we embrace conviction. Guilt, though, okay, damages our relationships with one another. Guilt can cause me to respond to people in wrong ways. Guilt can cause you and I to be impatient with other people. It can cause you and I to overreact in anger. Have you ever seen somebody overreact in anger? Yeah, sure you have. Maybe it's caused you. It's usually motivated by guilt when you get behind the root of it. You see, sometimes the person themselves don't even know what's going on because guilt can, can be that way in your life and my life. Guilt can cause you to spoil people, indulge people. You know, I feel guilty about this relationship. Maybe you're, you're divorced, and so what happens is your guilt causes you to spoil your kids. 
in a way that's unhealthy. And parents often feel guilty and overcompensate by indulging them. Or maybe guilt causes you to avoid relationships of where when you begin to talk about being committed, you back away. And so what I want you to know is this, that guilt damages relationships because it keeps you and I responding to people in ways that are not healthy or not good. Matter of fact, a lot of times it's the cause of problems in marriages. You know, things that have happened in your life before your marriage that maybe you still feel guilty about. And so it damages how you relate to your spouse. But what we see is this, guilt damages your relationship, but conviction strengthens your relationships. Because you have this core, you wanna be healthy, you wanna be able to deal with your regrets, and you wanna be able to move on, and so it strengthens your relationship, and you refuse to live in the past. But guilt, okay, keeps you stuck in the past, living in the past. It's like driving a car and constantly looking in the rearview mirror. You're going to end up crashing if you do that. Now, the rearview mirror gives you perspective, and it's good to have. But what happens is you don't want to focus in the rearview mirror. That's why your windshield is 100 times larger than your rearview mirror, is because God wants you to look more to the future, you see, guilt has a tendency for you and I to replay over and over and over again in our minds things that will never change, that you can't change, and I can't change. You see, guilt can't change the past, just like worry can't change the future. All it does is make you and I miserable. And so what happens is we've got to deal with our guilt. It's been said that most of the hospitals could be emptied today if people could just deal with their guilt because guilt has a way of wreaking havoc on our mind, on our emotions, even on our body. And so what we need to understand is guilt keeps you stuck in the past, but conviction allows you and I to move in the future. You see, conviction brings about a faith and a trust and a belief in God. It causes you and I to believe that the best is yet to come that there's a future that's bright because of God. And yet we come back to guilt again, and guilt is broad and hard to define, isn't it? That's the way the enemy loves it, because he deals in generalities. He wants to disrupt you. He wants to cause you to live in confusion. He wants you to, to have a life that's full of chaos, and so he speaks to us in generalities, but not so with God. Guilt is broad and hard to define, but conviction is pointed and very specific. You see, God is always specific because he's a God of order. And so God's always gonna be very specific. You don't have to question what God is wanting to say to you and me. He'll be straightforward. That's the good thing about him. And so what I wanna do is I wanna move us from guilt to conviction. I, I want you to deal with your regret, and so I want to take you through a process that I've gone through many, many times, and I'm sure that I will continue to go through because I don't want to live in the past. I want to deal with my regrets. You know, sometimes people will say, you know what, if I had to do it all over again, I'd do it just the same way. There's not one area of my life that I would do over again exactly the same way. Why? Because I get it wrong. And so I need to go through this process continually. And I want to help you with that today. So let me share it with you, all right? Here's the first one. Take a personal inventory. Take a personal inventory. I want to talk to those who really mean it when you say, I want to get on with my life. I want to get well. I don't want to just get better. I want to get well. I want to grow. And the procedure is very, very simple. But let, let me tell you, it requires a lot of courage, okay? Okay? And so you take a, a personal inventory. That means that you get a, a pencil and a pad and you sit down and you begin to say, what do I feel guilty about? What regrets do I have in my life? What am I remorseful about? What are those areas in my life that I know I need to change? And you ask God to help you. And if you do, guess what? He'll be specific. Ask him, God, what am I consciously feeling guilty about? What are those things that I'm unconsciously feeling guilty about? Those areas that I've messed up in. 
You see, David did this, and he was a man after God's own heart. Look at what he writes. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Check this out. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Man, I want everlasting life. And you might say, how can David say this? He's being so vulnerable, but generous. He's being, he's being genuine. He's being vulnerable, he's being transparent, he's being genuine. And you say, how can David do that? Because he knows God. He knows that God loves him unconditionally. If you will read those, those verses before Search My Heart, you'll find out that David is reminding himself of who God is. And so we take this personal inventory and we just say, God, you know what, I'm sitting here, I've got my pen and my pad, speak to me and don't rush through this. And by the way, as I said, it won't be a one-time occurrence in your life. You'll have to do this over and over and over and over again. You'll need to do it on a regular basis. And, and so you tell God, God, I'm tired of pretending. I'm tired of, of, of being someone that I'm not. And I'm asking you to speak. Now you might say, Dwight, why should I write it down? Because it forces you and I to get specific. You need to write it down because it helps you to be able to know exactly what you're dealing with. And it forces you and I to stop denying our problems. You see, God wants to bring conviction in your life and in my life. And we can allow him to do that because he loves us. So you ask God and you become very specific. Here's the second thing in the process. Accept responsibility for my faults. Accept responsibility for my faults. When I make this list, I can't blame my mom. I can't blame my dad. I can't blame other people. I can't blame my ex I can't blame my boss. I have to take ownership of where I am today. You see, Solomon writes this, and I think this is so powerful. The Lord gave us a mind and a conscience, and we can't hide from ourselves. Which basically means, if I can't hide from myself, I need to take responsibility for myself. I need to take responsibility for my choices. You see, here's what I believe, my friend, and I want you to hear my heart on this. The greatest holdup to your healing, okay, is you. Because it starts with you and I being radically honest and being able to say, you know what, I am the problem. And I'm going to take responsibility. It's not about changing relationships or changing jobs or changing towns or changing churches or locations and thinking everything will be fine. No, 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 no. The problem is wherever you go, that's where you are. And so we have to accept responsibility for our faults. Don't rationalize. Don't say, well, you know what? That happened a long, long time ago. Or everybody does it. Don't rationalize it. Don't minimize it. Don't say it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. That's why it's still playing over and over again in your mind. Don't say it's mostly their fault. Take responsibility. And if you'll do that, then you will stop defeating yourself. You'll stop deceiving yourself. You'll stop pretending. And so let me ask you a question. What are you pretending not to feel guilty about that you need to take responsibility for? See, that's a step towards not just getting better, but being healed. So accept your responsibility for your faults. Here's the third thing, and that is this. Confess to God and others. Confess to God and others. This is so, so, so important. You know, confession is, is a very, very important part of life, okay? So I need to do it to God, and I need to do it to other people. John writes it like this. He says, if we confess our sins, our wrongs, okay, our regrets, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that great? He says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not within us. That's why it's so important that we accept our responsibility. So I need to freely admit it, and when I do, God will forgive me. And you might say, well, what is the right way to ask God for forgiveness? Well, don't beg, okay? You don't have to beg God to forgive you. God wants to forgive you more than you're willing to ask for forgiveness. Don't bargain with him. 
Don't say, you know what, God, if you'll just forgive me this time, I promise I'll never do it again. You know what? You can't fulfill that promise. You're a human being. You're broken. So you don't have to beg. Don't bribe. Don't say, God, if, if you'll forgive me, you know what? I'll start reading the Bible more. I'll start going to church. I'll even tithe. No, you just believe. You believe. You believe that God will forgive you when you and I freely admit that we have done wrong. And we will find God utterly reliable, that he will forgive us of our sins, and he will cleanse us from all that is wrong and evil. You see, that word confess means to agree or to admit or to speak the same thing that God says that we've written down on our list. That's what confession is. We're asking God to show us where we've gone wrong, and then what happens is we confess, we agree to God. You're right, God, I was wrong. You're right, God, I did that. And it's the basis for forgiveness. And we can do that because it's God's nature to say, you're forgiven, Dwight, through Jesus Christ. And so you need to be able to make that list. Now, you might say, oh, Dwight, if I made that list, there's going to be some things on there I don't think that God can forgive me of. You're wrong. There is absolutely nothing that you'll put on that list that God cannot and will not forgive you. And so you confess to God, but you confess to another person. And this is so essential for you to be able to be healed. Look at what James says. James says, confess your faults, your regrets, okay, one to another, and pray for one another that you may be what? Healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. How are we healed? By admitting our faults and our wrongs to another person. And I, I know, Wally, what you're saying is, why do I need to drag somebody else into this? Why can't I just admit it to God? Why can't I just pray about it? Well, how's that working for you? You see? The reason why you need to confess it to somebody else is because the root of your problem, of my problem, is relational. We lie to one another. We deceive one another. We're dishonest with one another. We wear masks. And I'm not talking about COVID, okay? We pretend that we have it all together, but we don't. And so what happens is we deny our true feelings and we play games. And it isolates us from other people. And it prevents us from living in community and experiencing intimacy. And so we end up living with guilt and shame. And it makes us insecure. And God doesn't want that for you. And God doesn't want that for me. You've heard me say this many, 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 many times that you're as sick as your secrets. I've told you, I don't have secrets. See, I practice this. I practice this on a regular basis because I, I can't live like that. I don't have enough room in my mind to have secrets. And God says to you and I today, revealing your feelings is the beginning of healing. And so what happens is if you don't do that, you'll continue to hide, pretend, wear a mask, and it'll get bigger and bigger, and you will begin to exaggerate it. But the amazing thing is, if you can find somebody who you can be honest with and real with, and you can admit that to another person, I'm telling you, there is freedom there. You see, you'll begin to realize that everybody else has problems just like you. And so I want to encourage you to do it. It's God's way of freeing you. It's God's way of bringing healing to you and me. Now, you don't want to tell just anybody. Telling the wrong person could be big, big, big trouble. So you want to tell somebody that you can trust, you know, that, that is Christ-like, that can keep a confidence, who's not a gossip, okay? They're not, they're not going to tell somebody or they're not going to place it on Facebook. You want to share it with somebody that you can trust. You want to share it with somebody who understands the value of what you're doing, you want to share it with somebody who's godly, who's mature enough that they're not going to be shocked with what you share with them. And somebody who knows Jesus well enough that they can reflect his forgiveness to you. You don't have to tell everybody, you just got to tell somebody. And what happens is, and I've experienced this, all of a sudden, that secret that's been making you sick and keeping you stuck in the past stops making you sick. All because you were willing to confess to God and confess to somebody else. So, so, so important. See, that's why we encourage you, okay, 
to be in groups. You've got to develop some relationships with some people who you can be real and authentic and genuine with. It's the only way to be whole. Let me give you this last one, and that is this. Accept God's forgiveness then. Accept God's forgiveness. Listen, we're all in the same boat. We're all fallen. Who are we kidding? I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. None of us are perfect. We've all blown it, and we have blown it in huge ways. You see, it's not like I'm more righteous than you or you're more righteous than me. We've all got problems. You got problems. I got problems. All God's children got problems. They're just in different areas maybe. And, and so we need to accept God's forgiveness. Paul writes about this, and, and it's so powerful. He says, all of us, that's me, that's you, that's all of us, that, that's, that's the most godly person that you could imagine or think of. All of us have sinned, yet now God declares us, here's our word, not guilty. Not guilty. If we trust who? In Jesus, who freely takes away our sins. You see, what happens is when I accept God's forgiveness, when I confess to him, he forgives me instantly. He doesn't wait. He never makes us wait. We hold out forgiveness on one another, but God doesn't do it for you and me. He forgives us instantly. He forgives us freely. He takes away our sin. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. I can't either. But he forgives us freely, and he forgives us completely. He wipes it away. He removes it as far as the east is from the west. Isn't that great news? But he wants us to live in that forgiveness and that freedom. And so I have to remind myself over and over again because I don't get it right. I have to remind me myself of this truth that Paul says in Romans 8.1, there is now no condemnation for Dwight who lives in union with Christ Jesus. Isn't that amazing? That's the good news. And I can tell you from personal experience how great that feels not to live in condemnation. Because I keep a short list with God. You know what? Man, when I have a regret, when I get it wrong, when I sin, you know what? I confess to him, but I go to my friend and I, I tell him, hey, you know what? Here's where I'm struggling. And when we learn to receive God's forgiveness, it gives us the grace to be able to forgive ourselves, if you will. And so I, I want to encourage you to do something. I want to encourage you, if you've not gone through Discover Track, that you would go online and, and go through those, those opportunities and learn more about God and learn more about yourself. And then I encourage you to commit to being in a, a New Point group. This is so important because what happens is you may not fully know you're living your life in regret. And what happens is getting with people and finding out how God is working in their life is a huge step. So let me ask you a question. Do you believe that your best days are behind you or in front of you. Living in regret is believing that the best has passed you by. Living in hope believes that God continually has your best days always in front of you. You see, if you have fallen in a life of regret, I want you to know, listen to me, I want you to know that your best days are in front of you with Jesus Christ. See, we believe that Jesus makes life better, and he makes us better at life. And so I want to encourage you to respond to Christ. Allow him to give you hope that is beyond your past mistakes, your past regrets, all of your shortcomings, your sin. You see, God is bigger than all of that, and he wants to deal with your regret and my regret so we can move into the future. Would you pray with me? Just bow your heads wherever you are. Just quiet your heart. You know, maybe today you need to ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. Maybe you have a life of regrets and you feel guilty, you feel ashamed and it breaks your heart. He knows that and he loves you and he paid the price so that you could be free from your guilt and your shame and your regrets. And you can pray a simple prayer, just saying, God, as much as I know how and as much as I understand, I want to be free from this. And I agree with you of what you have to say about me. Help me to have the courage to sit down and 
to write some things out and to acknowledge them and place them before you and then trust that you'll forgive me. If you'll do that, I promise you, God will sweep over you a spirit of forgiveness and he will cleanse you and make you whole. For others of us, we've done that, but you know what? We still live with a sense of condemnation. I just want to encourage you to keep short accounts with God. When you blow it, you will. When when you sin, you will. That you'll just come back to God and, and you'll just say, God, you know, what do I need to do? I didn't get it right. Would you please forgive me? And I encourage you to develop a relationship with one or two people, three people that you can be genuine with, transparent with, vulnerable with, and just say, hey, you know what? Here's what's going on in my life. And it's worth the effort. It's worth the work because you know what will happen? You'll be freed. You'll be able to experience what God says about you and what he's done for you. And so, Father, we thank you today for who you are. We love you and we thank you for all that you've done to ensure us that our best days are in front of us and not behind us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.